to his computer. Welcome everybody to this very special edition of the Into the Impossible podcast with your fearful host, Professor Brian Keating, Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics at the University of California, San Diego, and co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And Arthur C. Clarke was, of course, very fascinated with things fanciful, science fiction related, and even constructing things science fiction related on the surface of the moon. And today we're talking with a frequent guest, a friend of the show, a friend of the center, and a big thinker, Dr. James Beecham, uh, who I have yet to meet in person, but he's been a multi <laughs> multi-time guest on the show. He's really a big thinker. He's an innovator, and he's an experimentalist like me. Uh, but that means, as I've told my ideological children, if not my biological children, who I do tell on occasion, uh, to be an experimentalist is an important uh, uh, is is different than being a theorist. Our theorist, who James and I know and love, uh, we our colleagues, we we have to know the theory as well as the experiment, which is a one way kind of direction. Not to say that you know the best the best theorists do know the theory and experiment very well, but they don't actually do the experiment. Uh, the best experimentalists have to know the theory, maybe not create new theories, but they have to do the experiment and know the theory. So it's a different branch of physics. And I like to bring to you, my audience, my beloved audience, from time to time, a technical level of talk that shows you cutting edge uh, physics and even beyond what we're capable of doing now, because as uh, a Kennedy brother once said, uh, man's or woman's uh, reach should always exceed his or her grasp. And I think you know some of these innovative things. Well, they might be poo-pooed now by certain uh, theoretically inclined people. So too would would things even by the creators of the theory a hundred years ago, like Einstein, famously saying that things like gravitational lensing, gravitational waves would never be of a detectability and should not be even taken seriously. And he would only do them as a favor to certain friends of his. It's funny because they. He would do these calculations and then they'd be published in Nature, which I, I don't think, you know, James and I can do that in our papers. Uh, <laughs> or otherwise. But anyway, James is joining us. Uh, he's an eminent physicist. He's also doing yeoman's work because I think James and I agree that a scientist nowadays, he, uh, he or she must also engage with the public. James and I are supported, um, you know, in my case, supported uh, from my very earliest ages as a, as a public school kid. Um, I went to uh, public high school, public, um, you know, elementary school, all the way to high school, went to uh, Case Western, then I went to, to Brown, and then finally I ended up here as a professor at a state school in California. Uh, James, I'm sure any one of us, James, who has been sponsored by a university research grant or a public uh, national, uh, uh, you know, grant from the National Science Foundation Department of Energy grant, we rely on the beneficence of the public, and I feel like we have to give back. And James, you do a phenomenal job giving back both on um, in your public talks, in your um, in your research online that you present, and, and you've been also on some uh, on some movies as well. And I just want to salute you for doing that. I, I believe myself. I joke. It's kind of a uh, it's kind of my moral obligation to do it. And uh, <laughs> maybe maybe that's taking it a little too seriously. But I, I do want to salute you. You do so much great outreach. I love your Twitter feed. Um, and I love, uh, I love, of course, more than anything, the research that you do. But you're an experimentalist. Today, we're going to take a little uh, tour, both your personal world line, what got you so excited about physics. And just imagine somewhere out there, there's a young James or a young um, Jamona, Jenny, whatever, <laughs> somebody out there who could be inspired yeah, to take a voyage into the impossible to learn about what it takes to build stuff with his or her hands to explore the micro world and connect it to the macro world of the greater universe. So James, with that, I'll ask you to take it away and talk about a big bang machine on the surface of Earth's closest neighbor, the moon. James, take it away. Well, thanks extremely to you, uh, Brian, because uh, thanks for the kind words and thanks thanks for the uh, the platform, the opportunity. Um, and I say platform because I really, really enjoy uh, your audience. Every time I've been on here, we get wonderful questions after after the facts and great interactions. It's just really phenomenal what you put together here. So back at you with the bravo and the the kudos and the uh, saludos. It's uh, fantastic stuff. 
Um, and I love the fact that, you know, every time I, you know, every few months or something, I check your uh, subscribers on YouTube and it just keeps going up, man. So keep it going. Keep it going. I like it. Uh, yeah. um, and I like it even more so because like so many podcasts and things are very much on this sort of, um, you know, especially science minded ones. They're very kind of like they can get super into kind of speculative territory, but they they, they so often, you know, because that gets a lot of clicks and things like that. But not as often as what you do is you sort of like bring it down and kind of ground it. And I really like that. And to me, that sort of is a nice match with some of the stuff that I end up thinking about just sort of naturally um, because so the, you know, the reason that I'm ostensibly here is just a few days ago um, one of my collaborators and I put a paper on the archive um, that made uh, the entirety of the high energy physics uh, community sort of start scratching their heads um, some of them I think were inspired some were uh, confused and then a few other ones were uh, really kind of um, uh, kind of intrigued um, and I've had a, a huge panoply of responses so far to this. And it really was um, a, uh, it's not a proposal. It's, it's not a concrete proposal in any way, but it really is from an experimentalist perspective, an examination of what it would take for us to build a large Hadron Collider style collider that instead of 27 kilometers around circles around the entire circumference of a great circle of the moon, which is 11,000 kilometers. And so, <laughs> I, I, I like the opportunity to be here so that, you know, I can kind of motivate that in a certain way, right? Because if you hear that and you're, you know, if you're a science-minded person, you kind of understand maybe, but not really understand completely why bigger is better. If you're completely in the public, you hear this, you're like, wait, what, what do, how do these things go together? What is the Higgs boson, blah, blah, blah. So I really, really enjoy uh, this opportunity to kind of, you know, take it uh, a little bit deep. And, you know, there's a clarification here. I have been talking about such a project for many years now. Um, uh, and I gave some public talks about it. 2018, there's a talk that I gave that you can find the video for on uh, at the Royal Institution. Um, and at the time, it was very much a, you know, kind of just an inspirational tool, right? It's an idea for people to get inspired by. It's like, wow, and gee whiz, and it's big. And, you know, I was like, yeah, we, in principle, maybe this could happen. But the whole crux of that talk at the time in 2018 was that I didn't know what the details were because I'd never done the numbers. I'd never bothered to go through it. Um, I knew what the motivation for it was, what the big idea was, but in terms of the real numbers, no one had ever done it. So just, to, you know, I finally got around to doing it. And uh, um, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about here um, because it's kind of wild what we can get into. So the first thing that I want to, you know, emphasize to people is that, you know, right now, as far as I'm concerned, this is like the most uh, the, the most interesting time and the most amazing time to be a scientist, you know, ever like to be alive in the history of, of science, because you can think back, you know, hundreds of years ago when people were, you know, before before like, uh, you know, Ptolemy and Copernicus and Galileo and like, you know, things were very kind of interesting and moving around. And those were big steps forward that were made and the scientific questions that were being debated were very huge. But right now we're at this really important part in human history where we have so many huge open questions in basic physics and we're kind of out of, we have run out of big hints as to what we should do to answer these questions. And I think as your audience would know, right? Things like dark matter, we know that dark matter exists. We've known that it exists empirically. It's just, it's proven that something called dark matter exists. We have no clue what it is still. We've been looking for this for decades. We know that the universe is expanding, you know, and, and a, a few billion years ago, it ended up just starting to accelerate its expansion for some reason. We don't know why. We have good ideas, but we do not have, uh, we don't have that answer to that. We don't know why our universe is made of matter and not antimatter. We don't know the answer to this. And the problem with the, the crux of this moment is that we have these big open questions, but like I said, we're sort of out of the big hints. And that's where this thing you mentioned with respect to the, the kind of dichotomy be, between theorists and experimentalists comes in. Theorists, that's, you know, that's their day job, right? It's like they're supposed to come up with these ideas and new ideas as to how to test things. And in principle, you know, kind of dig into those, the details of the math and the implications, blah, blah, blah. And in the past, the 20th century was filled with so many hints that ended up just being kind of like, bing, you should go over here and you'll find this. And there it was. You should go over here and find this. And there it was. And we're sort of out of those. So I wanted to just kind of, I'm going to get into this in a little bit of detail here, but I really just want to emphasize that to my mind, it, this is the most important, like, this is the most amazing time to yeah. be alive as a scientist, because we get to look at things like this. Me, so to my mind, there we go. please. There we go. So 
This is uh, an event display, and some of your audience might know a little bit about the uh, Large Hadron Collider. But this is a this is a, a an event display that we that we this is a, something we refer to as an event display in the Atlas experiment, which is the one that I work on, and it's one of the big experiments of the Large Hadron Collider. And what this shows is you had more or less this kind of cylindrical geometry. You had two protons at extremely high energies that came in both sides of this thing. They slammed together in the middle, and they managed to shoot out two hadronic jets in opposite directions. And if you, if you reconstruct the invariant mass of these two jets objects, you get some 9.5 TeV. Before 2015, our species could never have even considered looking at something like this. This is like, the, you know, this, this, is, this is the highest energy stuff we've ever seen in our lives. And the reason, and of course the machine that made this, uh, this uh, you know, um, the, the machine that made this, of course, is the, oh, and just for, so some people might know, um, they might understand it a little bit here, but just a quick note on the notation. So in collider physics, we often use uh, this so-called natural units. And so this is where H bar equals C equals one. And we usually measure mass and energy in the same units, which is EV or some fraction of those or some you know uh, uh, order magnitude of that. So this is TeV. And an electron, for example, has a mass of about half an MeV an electron zipping around a proton in the ground state of hydrogen has a kinetic energy of about 13.6 EV. And so TeV is trillions of EV. And the two protons that collided to create this collision event each had a kinetic energy of about 6.5 TeV. And the machine that created it, as you know, is called the Large Hadron Collider. And this is the largest machine in the world. So the Large Hadron Collider is a 27 kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland, about 100 meters underground. Um, and in this tunnel, uh, so this is what it looks like from the kind of aerial, uh, from the aerial view. And in this tunnel, we use superconducting magnets that we have to keep colder than outer space. And we use them to accelerate protons to almost the speed of light, something like 99.999999 or something of the speed of light. Uh, and then we slam them into each other 40 million times a second. And so it's the largest machine in the world. Um, and it accelerates protons starting from that little bottle of hydrogen you saw. It's really a, a, a kind of modest bottle of hydrogen. It will never run out of protons for probably, the, you know, if we wanted to run it for a million years or something. Um, and it starts them, it, it doesn't get up to that high energy immediately. You start in kind of smaller rings. You go to about to 50 MeV, up to 1.4 GeV, and then to 25 GeV, and then to 450 GeV, and then eventually to 13 TeV, which is what you're seeing here. And the protons are kept in the circular orbit by about 1,200 dipole magnets um, that are with hundreds of other quadrupole magnets that are used for focusing. And they're all bathed in liquid helium at 1.9 Kelvin. And this is to ensure that they're super con uh, conducting, right? So this is what we think is probably the coldest extended object in the universe. Maybe some other civilization out there has exceeded our uh, technological capabilities and that maybe they have something better. But as far as we know, this is probably it. Um, in terms of just some kind of fun other details, it takes about 45 minutes for us to fill, so to, so to speak, the LHC with protons. And then they collide for about 10 hours at four points on this ring at about 40 megahertz. And so the, after that, the kind of the, the, the machine sort of dumps the beam and then we have to start again. And the power consumption is kind of equivalent to about one third of that of Geneva. And it's mostly taken from the city of Geneva and it's mostly taken from France. So that's kind of like a crash course uh, in what we do, right? And so- No the, pun intended. Um, <laughs> no. And so, and this is, you know, this is fascinating to us because the thing we're really trying to do here is, I mean, not to be too glib about it, but really what we're trying to do when you collide protons at such high energies, you're really recreating the conditions of the universe as they were in a very sampling, sampled laboratory controlled way, just after the moment of the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. And I think you know this, right? But what you, you know, if you look out in space right now, everything, as you know, is everything's expanding, everything's moving apart from each other. And if you look out in space, the, the average temperature of the, inner, of the universe is very low. It's very small right now. If it's, but that's not always the case. If you just run the clock backwards, right? The, the YouTube slider on the video, everything had to get uh, closer and closer together. 13.8 billion years ago, everything was packed into a tiny, dense little point. So the universe at the conditions of the universe at that moment were very, very different because things start to bump into each other and things are radiating and everything's really hot. So as when we collide protons at extremely high energies, we're actually sort of recreating the conditions of the universe back then. And this is interesting because, you know, the one thing that I kind of like to keep in mind when you think about all this type of research that do, why are we doing this research is that 
you know, maybe it seems a little bit arcane, but really it's just based upon a very, very simple question, which is how small can I cut anything? Right. So if I, you know, as a New Yorker, I like to take a bagel, right? It's like I've been, I guess I've been in Switzerland for, you know, seven years now. I'm not so much of a New Yorker anymore, <laughs> but, you know, take a bagel and cut the bagel in half and keep going. Can you cut the half and half? Keep going. You get to a crumb. Can you cut that? Of course, you get to a molecule. Can you cut a molecule? It's yes, it's made of atoms. Can you cut an atom? Yes, it's made of like a proton and electron. Can you cut the electron? As far as we know, the answer is no. Can you cut a proton though? It turns out, yeah, there's stuff inside of a proton. And so this is, of course, the kind of very simplistic way of thinking about it. But really, what it, indic what it indicates is that when you ask such a simple question, seemingly simple, you're secretly asking a much more profound question, which was what was holding anything together to begin with. And once you open up that question, it has immediate implications upon everything in existence. Because if you understand those rules about how everything fits together, you understand not just how we fit together and how this dark matter that's flowing through our body fits together, but also how structures formed in the universe at all, how gold is formed in the collisions of, you know, whatever neutron stars or something like that, you know, you understand this much, much better. So that's really what we're going in search of. We're trying to understand the basic rules of the universe. And so I'll just go through like a very quick crash course, again, crash course, there it is. We do this pun many times in this, uh, in this episode, I think. Um, at the smallest possible scales in our universe, um, the, the universe is composed of tiny vibrating packets of waving probability. And these are called particles that they each carry energy, momentum, and other key properties. And these particles are best described, in fact, and characterized as excitations in quantum fields. And they're not just individual chunks of stuff floating through nothing, as you know. And so as a result, our current uh, understanding of particle physics uses a framework called quantum field theory, um, of which the standard model of particle physics, which you probably have heard of, uh, of part is, is one. It's a very successful example of a quantum field theory. So most of particle physics and the, uh, and, and the standard model, which is represented here in a nice kind of uh, schematic form, as well as physics in general, follows from or is driven by as you know, conservation laws. So quantities that the universe either exactly or approximately conserved or conserves or does not. And I think you know this, but you know, for example, these can be very familiar things like energy and momentum and uh, electric charge, but they can be more arcane things like spin and isospin and parity and hypercharge and strangeness, et cetera, and combinations of all these things. Um, and you know, we don't have time to go into too much of uh, another's theorem here, but there's a deep connection, of course, between conservation laws that even the ones that, you know, high school students understand in, in, in physics and, in, you know, high school physics and the mathematical symmetries that are in the standard model. Um, and so this, that's just a, you know, kind of basic picture of what's going on with the, with the universe. And the, we have two, you know, as a result of all of these kinds of conservation laws and the way that we understand the building blocks of the universe, we end up with two general classes of particles that are based upon spin. Um, and we have fermions, which are these particles that have half integer spin values, and then you have bosons that have integer spin values. And so this is, again, something you know. So symmetry is called gauge, the special types of symmetries, they're called gauge symmetries, and the standard model, and these lead to special particles that are known as vector gauge bosons, which correspond to three of the known fundamental forces of nature. And here, there's sort of the ones in the middle row here, right? So you have the photon, which is the force carrying particle of uh, electromagnetism, the W and Z, which are the force carriers for the weak force. And then you have gluons, which are the force carriers for QCD or the strong force. And so this is really fascinating because as we see now, as far as we know, there are three fundamental forces or there are four fundamental forces, but three of which are described by the standard model. And, that, and this is interesting because at high enough scales, it turns out that our understanding of forces gets completely messed up, right? So we have, we know that at high enough energy scales, for example, the electromagnetism and the weak force are in fact two parts of the same thing, the electroweak force. And that this thing is spontaneously broken in the standard model, which results in exactly one scalar boson, this Higgs boson, which we'll talk about a little bit in a moment here, um, that's responsible for giving mass to most elementary particles. And then, uh, yeah, so then, so these are the bo bosons or the so-called vector gauge bosons and the bosons and the Higgs is also a boson, but not vector. And so that's, that's the one kind of class. And then we also have these other ones which are known as fermions. And that's basically everything else. And these are quarks. These are the ones that stick together to make hadrons like protons and neutrons and uh, baryons like pions and, uh, and also uh, pions and mesons, things like that. And then we also have leptons, right? And so these are electrons and muons and taus and the neutrino partners. 
right? And so really, I, you know, if you want sort of just like, if you want to describe the universe to some kind of like, if you had a person that came from like a, a completely different type of, you know, universe in the multiverse, you didn't know exactly what their rules were. And they asked us how everything worked in our universe. You could tell them that basically everything in the smallest possible scales, uh, our universe is described by fermions exchanging bosons. And that would go a long way to describing, uh, for, you know, in a very kind of simple way, what our universe uh, you know, does. I've had um, a lot of uh, our theoretical friends that are more theoretically inclined and they will speak about great mysteries such as, you know, the repetition of the number three here. And we don't want to get too mystical here on the Into the Impossible podcast, but the, uh, the repetition of three families, three generations, um, and, and so forth, uh, the three different bosons, et cetera. Um, do we, although we have an explanation and we have an accounting, we have a taxonomy, um, do we have a fundamental understanding of, you know, why, why are there three of these things? Why, why do we have, you know, some, uh, what, what is the uh, nature of the universe? Is it integer? Is it, is it rational? Is it irrational? Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, God equations and so forth, are these integer equations? I always, I'm always asking my theoretically uh, minded colleagues, what do you think, James? Yeah, these are very good questions. And again, these are the ones that uh, that the theorists, we pay them for their day jobs to think about for us, right? Um, me personally, I, you know, I, we've talked about this in other, in slightly other capacities, either on this show or other projects that we've done, right? And so those those to me are the, the, the some of the most fascinating questions. But for me as an experimentalist, the answer is we do not know. <laughs> we do not know the answer to that. And we also don't have a good explanation for what, why these patterns are the way they are. They just really are. I mean, there, there, there really isn't. You can make, some people try to make some arguments about how, you know, it's like you need to have three families because of X, Y, Z. Um, but at the end of the day, those are, they typically rely upon some other kind of unsats or they rely upon some other kind of like, uh, some other kind of assumptions. And sort of a priori, there really is none because you, you know, you can imagine really you can, you can write down completely other standard, you, uh, sorry, you could write down completely other quantum field theories that are consistent and they're renormalizable and blah, blah, blah. And they, in principle, can have a totally different uh, structure to them, right? So this is one of the things that theorists in my field, right, so that I do high energy particle physics, collider physics, um, the theorists in, a lot of the theorists in my field are, they're sort of they would often be referred to as theorist phenomenologists, right? And so they end up having to kind of take the sort of the, the gauge structure of the standard model and see how you can kind of extend that in sort of really kind of straightforward ways or sometimes not so straightforward to accommodate some of the unexplained uh, phenomena, right? So, you know, the simplest, for example, if you had just an extra U1 uh, to the, the gauge group of the standard model, that could end up giving you some extra particles that you can search for, or you might just add something kind of simple or, you know, a little bit more com complex, right? This this uh, this gluon, uh, uh, this, these quarks and gluons over on the right of this little diagram, right? These are all described, uh, or the force that kind of holds them together is, is the strong force. And the strong force is also known as QCD, right? And quant uh, quantum chromodynamics. And the QCD is totally unlike the other forces, right? Mm -hmm. As you know. Um, and it has, but it's also, it's also a, you know, an example of a type of uh, confining gauge force, right? You can have other ones, right? And so one of the things, in fact, that I that I uh, research a lot at the LHC is alternate versions of QCD that could be in the dark sector, so so-called dark QCD or dark showers. Mm -hmm. um, and this this leads to once you make this kind of straightforward assumption that maybe the dark sector, and by dark sector I mean some some kind of secluded standard or sorry uh, quantum field theory, theoretical sector where there could be particles that live and they have different masses and things but it's isolated from our standard model because there's no there's no force that we know of that connects them so that the particles of our of us and the particles of this dark sector talk together um, and you can come up with something that's not a simple U1. You can come up with something that's more complex, like an SU3 or an SU10 or something like that. Yeah. And you can also have the particular coupling constants of this QCD it could be something completely higher and much lower, and it could have a, a larger number of flavors, a larger number of colors, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So in terms of that, there's, there's, you know, to my mind, there's no good a priori explanation for why these patterns are the way they are. Again, I'm, I'm happy to, I love to hear arguments that there, that people come up with some, but mm -hmm. none of them are so convincing to me. Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> I don't know, what do, you, what do you think? Are you convinced well, by any of them? You've been listening to them for a long time, yeah? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the fundamental question, you know, I think is is a good one. I think it's a profound one. You, some say that, yeah, only two of them are, are fundamental. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course there are, you know, questions, as you say, how do they relate to, you know, higher embeddings? 
Are they manifestations of, of, of um, you know, just our lower order glimpses at these? But again, this is stuff that I don't particularly traffic in. You know, my, my questions will, will be you know, much more primitive. But, um, but certainly things like, you know, I think the, the departures from symmetries, you know, people, we focus a lot on the symmetries, the group behaviors, but it's really, you know, the, the departures of symmetries that fascinate me more, you know, I, I always joke, you know, make the joke with you, but, you know, when they, when they say, you know, symmetry is beautiful and when we should look for symmetry. And I had Frank Wilczek on many times and, and, uh, you know, he obviously talks about this in a beautiful question <clears throat> and, but if you, if you do studies and even in art, you know, you take like the most handsome man in the world is besides the two of us is reputed to be Brad Pitt. And, but they do studies, they take Brad Pitt and they, they cut him down the middle and they reflect the left half of his face and the right half. And he's grotesque and he's disgusting <laughs> even more than he is normally compared to the two of us. And, um, and so it's really the departure. That means the departure, even artistic and, and, and physiological beauty uh, departure. So anyway, I think we talk a lot about neither and, and it is, you know, obviously a wonderful uh, theorem, but, but it's really the departure and the spontaneous symmetry that's broke. And one wonders if, if that, you know, then does imply if there's something even more primitive at higher energies and, and maybe that's where we'll come, but we should move on because you have so many cool things to show and we have a limited time yeah. before our next, uh, our next experimental, you know, I always say, I thought astronomers lived on telescopes, but we live on telecon. So <laughs> we should keep going. With your cool, but the, sure. I, I don't want to short shrift you. No, it's okay. I mean, it's, these are really, these are really important questions. Sorry. <clears throat> these are really important questions, right? So I, you know, again, I, I totally agree with you that this is what I think, you know, why I always mention when I talk about symmetries and notice theorem is that, yeah, symmetries are, are uh, you know, it's an observation about the universe, right? And what that means is that, but the, but the, tri the reality is that the universe uh, obeys some of those symmetries and respects them and completely violates other ones. Yeah. Right. So that's that to me is, you know, again, I totally agree with you. Right. It's like yeah. the the sort of um, the deviation from a symmetry can be much more fascinating sometimes. Right. You know, yep. why does why does CP violation happen maximally in one sector, but completely not at all observed in another sector? <laughs> right. No, you know, this is this is a fascinating question. Right. Yep. And if somebody can come up with a, a wonderful, elegant, a priori reason for that, I would be I like your theory, mm. but I haven't heard it yet. So, yep. <laughs> OK, so we're going to keep going. Um, and so, but the important thing for us, for and for the you know the notion of a <clears throat> circular collider on the moon, um, is that the elementary particles that we know of, they in fact the, all the ones that you see here on this thing, they have a very wide range of masses. And as you know in spe special relativity, mass and energy are related. So this is important for collider physicists because you know if nature has a particle with a mass m that's extremely high, that's kinetic higher than the kinetic energy that you know, E that we as physicists have ever used in a collider experiment, we'll never be able to produce it directly and then in abundance and measure its properties. And so that's where, again, so much of what we do comes down to Einstein at the end of the day, right? Is that, and by produce, what I mean is that when we collide two particles together, they're, you know, again, it's sort of like a, a kind of, a, a kind of a glib way, but, you know, it's a, it's a good heuristic, right? Is that their wave functions can overlap, right? And they can interfere to create new states. And it, these, if these states exist in nature, right? If it's an actual resonance in nature. And so in this case, the two particles that came to collide, they actually cease to exist. And a new particle is created in their place that lives for a small amount of time before then decays into other things that hit our detector that fly away from the collision point and hit our detector. And so this is schematically drawn here by one of these kind of Feynman diagrams. And you know when we collide protons, it's actually not the typically the protons don't actually hit head on uh, and and collide. Typically, you end up they end up uh, being able to get close enough so that they interact. The individual quarks or gluons can get pulled out, and those are the things that collide. Oh, and this is just a leftover from uh, yeah. So this, but the particle in the middle is the thing we're kind of interested in, right? So this could be a Z boson, or this could be a new thing like the Higgs boson, or it could be something totally different like a dark photon or something like that we're, that we're looking for. Um, and the reason why we right now, as I keep emphasizing, right now is such a fascinating time uh, to be alive as a physicist is that we again we have this 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 wild number of open questions in physics but really no more hints. And those hints are, you know, it, 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 to me, we have to kind of retrain our brain, brains as particle physicists to get away from the kind of 20th century mindset, to be honest, because the 20th century was mag magnificently lucky. <laughs> we basically, it was like clockwork. You can start, here's like a very breakneck history of, uh, the of, of 
particle physics in the 20th century. You start from, you know, 1897, Thompson was able to discover the electron by himself on a, on a tabletop. And then in 1919, the proton came from out of nowhere. And then 1932, the neutron, and then you discover muons and then uh, neutrinos. And then the, the, and back into the 60s, you we realized that there's actually structure down inside uh, things like protons and neutrons, which are known as partons. And then you get to 1974 when the when the J-Psi particle was discovered. And this more or less definitively uh, demonstrated that the charm quark was real, which made people take seriously this notion of uh, quarks and gluons as not just a bookkeeping tool, but actual legitimate individual particles. And then you had the tau lepton, and then you had the gluon, and then you had the W and Z bosons, which were more or less kind of predicted to be right within this kind of energy range and pow, there they were. And then the top quark, and the last remaining piece to be plugged into all of this was the Higgs boson, which my colleagues and I discovered in 2012 at the LAC, congratulations. And, and that's a fascinating place to be because, oh, and just a quick sort of like side note in terms of personal history here. So uh, Martin Pearl was the discoverer, uh, you know, leading the group that discovered the tau had a student uh, who was named Sam Ting, uh, who was part of the team that discovered the JSI, one of the two teams. Sam Ting had a student who was named Sao Lan Wu, uh, who was one of the teams that discovered the gluon. Sao Lan Wu works with uh, me on Atlas and also with my advisor, Kyle Cranmer. And Kyle Cranmer was one of the editors of the paper that discovered the Higgs boson oh. in Atlas. So where does that leave me? <laughs> because- oh, and one more thing, yeah. <laughs> Sam Ting, in addition to the last uh, four letters of my last name, uh, Sam Ting is the PhD advisor of the new uh, project uh, executive project manager of the Simons Observatory, uh, Gary Sanders, who is a former project manager of TMT and LIGO. So uh -huh. he is now working at UC San Diego at the Simons Observatory, and he uh, was, you know, directly responsible for the uh, Nobel Prize, uh, et cetera, by uh, by my friends uh, Barry Barish, guest on the show, Ray Weiss, guest on the show, and. Uh, Kip Thorne, hopefully soon to be guest on the show. That's uh, really, uh, it's really fun to see him up there. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's such a you know it's interesting to kind of look at your genealogy in terms yeah. <laughs> of not just your own PhD but also the people that you've kind of touched throughout your career. It's wonderful. Right. Small world. But the, but the interesting thing here, right, is that once you have the Higgs boson, what's left, right? And so <laughs> the Higgs boson was this fascinating thing, right? And for us in particle physics, July fourth, twenty twelve, was sort of the day where where everything changed because. After you know collecting and analyzing uh, you know uh, collisions at an, a center of mass collision energy of seven and eight TeV, we in the Atlas collaborations announced the discovery of a new particle that was consistent with the uh, ob observation of a standard model Higgs boson. And this was a monumentally uh, monumental achievement and seemingly completed the standard model. But the LHC was designed to go to higher energies, and so on June third uh, in twenty fifteen. Uh, many of us gathered in this, you know, Atlas control room to observe the first ever collisions at this highest energy, 13 TeV that we'd ever seen before. And this was applause and champagne, and it was really a lot of fun. And it was a very heady time because we, because we uh, didn't have any idea of what we're going to find in this data, because the Higgs, again, was the last remaining piece to be plugged into the standard model. And beyond that, we don't know what there's going to be. We know there have to be things, but, but we don't know what they're going to be. And so... Uh, and, and so, yeah, just to emphasize the point again, sorry. And this is interesting because you think about the Higgs boson as this gigantic discovery, a wonderful thing. And this is the case, this is the way things happen, right? So like, this is the number of open questions in physics before July 4th, 2012, right? Does the Higgs boson exist? You know, what is dark matter? How does, what's universe's uh, expansion? You know, uh, how, what, why are the particular families of quarks and leptons the way they are? Um, you know, what are neutrinos? What are the masses? You know, why they have the hierarchy they do. And then after the discovery, <laughs> this is the number of open questions. The Higgs only answered one and it opened up a huge number of other right. questions, right? So this is again why I say that this is a fascinating and wonderful time to be a physicist, but it's also very daunting yeah. because I can tell you that now as we have collected more data at this 13 TeV, we have successfully established a wide range of results that are consistent with standard model expectations also known as we have discovered no new particles so far beyond the Higgs. And this is the biggest open question right now is that where does the standard model lose validity, right? Because that's the thing. It's like we get to this point where the standard model has this strange, uh, you know, uh, the strange ordering of masses of particles and things like that. But we know that it's incomplete. We know for a fact that it's incomplete. 
It doesn't include gravity. It doesn't include dark matter or dark energy. It doesn't explain the matter, antimatter, asymmetry of the universe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's no comprehensive explanation for why the structure is the way it is, right? And the kicker, the kicker is that in principle, it could be applicable all the way up to the Planck scale. Hmm. So the, the Planck scale is a 10 to the 16 GeV. Yeah. And, or there, so, so we have the LHC down here and there could be discoveries or, or so it could be applicable all the way up to the Planck scale in principle. It's a bit weird, but okay, maybe. Or there could be discoveries anywhere between our TeV scale and up to the, uh, the Planck energy. And so that's really where we finally get to the, this idea, right? Is like, we need to think, we, to my mind, we need to change our brains as physicists when we think about collider physics and instead of saying, oh, we need to build, you know, uh, this collider, this particular energy, because I want to discover X. Instead, we think, how big can we go? And to measure different things about the standard model predictions in all of these energy ranges up to and including the Planck scale. And it's a different mindset, right? It's, a, it's not like we're going to discover supersymmetry. I'm going to discover squarks and gluons. I'm going to discover the Higgs. Instead, it's like, what can we do with the current technology right. and future yeah, technology I, to get I, as high I, as possible? I've been phrasing it lately, you know, are we putting the, the, the toe before the gut? I mean, we don't, you know, we everyone's fascinated yeah. with the theory of everything. We don't correct me if I'm wrong, James, you're so much more of an expert than I am. We don't have a grand unified theory that everybody agrees on. Correct. Or, or am I wrong? No, no, no. There's, there's many competing ideas and things flowing around that we don't even have that. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So and this that, is I mean, the that's, desert. That's is this the thing. desert that they talk about, James? Is this what you're depicting yeah, this, here? The this, kind of desert? This is the desert. Yes, this is the desert. And again, you, I, I love to discuss with my theorist colleagues about different, uh, you know, um, motivations, so to speak, for where the new, you know, where the new scale of particles and fields could show up, where that will help us, uh, you know, help us explain things. And, but at the end of the day, those are all based upon some kind of assumptions or some kind of, you know, some kind of uh, uh, ansatz, or they're honestly based upon, you know, the kind of prediction as to what we can possibly do. It's like, oh, you know, for example, supersymmetry is a great idea, right? Supersymmetry, think, speaking of symmetries, um, this is not a supersymmetry show, but again, supersymmetry is a, is a fantastic idea. There's nothing, it's neither wrong nor right. It's just a really wonderful idea that the universe either uh, observes or does not observe. We haven't seen any uh, uh, evidence of it so far, but the issue with supersymmetry is that it has such a large parameter space that the masses of, and the, the scale of these particles could show up really a lot, you know, a huge range of places. And as you're pointing out with respect to like grand unified theories and things like that, for, for example, the scale at which uh, the electro weak and the strong force become one thing, that's in principle something extremely high too from a very kind of simple, I, I guess the, what is it? The, the Georgia and Glashow uh, perspective would be something like, uh, I'm gonna get this wrong, but it's like, it'd be ten, yeah, yeah. something like that. But it's like 10, uh, like, you know, six or seven orders of magnitude high, higher in energy than what we have now. Mm -hmm. Something yeah. like that, I don't know. We, we'd get the exact number, but that's, that's, that's pretty large. But it's also, that's one particular idea. It could be in principle be other things. Again. Can we go back a slide um, or two? Let me just see. Um, yeah, stop. I'll go, go forward. One more slide. Uh, one more. Yeah, this one. So when you're looking at there uh, in the middle and you're all excited there, tell me yeah. on a daily basis or, you know, in a, in a, in a decade long basis, it takes you to get your PhD and in, in your field. Like, what do you do? I know what I do. You know, my students are in the lab across the building here. I can see them now. They're working hard. Hi, guys. Um, you know, we're testing bolometers, which are ultra sensitive power detectors that can detect a billionth of a billionth of a watt in one second. You know, we're, we're making basically sensitive uh, thermal heat detectors that have to be ultra cold. You, you showed that, you know, our data look like time series data. Um, these are very sophisticated images, you know, fast image. Pro Tell me a little bit about what's it like to be an experimentalist, a graduate student, what was some of the training you got? What was your, um, you know, as an undergraduate, what's like the right preparation that someone gets? Is it, is it, you know, cause a theoretician it's, it's obvious. You know, I always say like to be a theoretical physicist is like kind of what they train you for as all of graduate school, uh, undergraduates, like all the theoretical class, they're all theoretical. I mean, yeah, you take a lab, but it's already prepackaged. Somebody won a Nobel prize for it 50 years ago, Davis and Germer, <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever. But it's like, it's, it's nothing like what you do in graduate school as a graduate student, experimental astrophysics. So tell me, what do you do to train to become the graduate student that you were? And, and what is a graduate student actually doing on a daily basis? Yeah, so a large percentage of what uh, graduate students that work on these big experiments at the LHC do, a large percentage of it is uh, data science. So a huge amount of it is data, you know, analytics and um, 
uh, data reduction, uh, you know, with, with physics reasoning based upon what you're doing, of course. Um, so a large amount of it is, you know, just being conversant with uh, how to manipulate data and how to manipulate code. Um, but that's that's you know, sort of percentage wise what we end up doing. That's a lot of it, right? But we also end up writing papers and blah, blah, blah. But to the training thing, so to answer your question, actually to give a little bit of history for me, I'm, uh, I had a completely different bachelor's degree first in uh, the arts, in film. Um, and then I realized I was still obsessed with physics uh, and specifically particle physics that I always been obsessed with these, with these kind of two things since I was a kid. Um, cinema is a very uh, fascinating way of exploring complex ideas but then also really understanding the basic rules of everything around us. And so I went back and did a second bachelor's degree in physics and math. Everyone said I was crazy, but uh, you know, here I am and it worked out. And what I did, and just to give, you know, kind of uh, just to give a little bit of, um, uh, you know, uh, credit where credit is due based upon the thing you said at the first part of the show too. I just started with community college courses, right? Cause I, they're not going to let you into a, P, a physics PhD program. If you don't have, you know, an actual PhD, or I'm sorry, if you don't have a bachelor's degree in physics and math. So I started with community college courses and I did my basics, uh, you know, a community college. So I'm hundred percent with you in terms of public schools and the, we need to ensure huge funding for those as much, you know, uh, robust funding uh, in perpetuity. And, and that's part um, of the so mission as, of this channel is like to supplement and augment. I love community college. I love public schools. But nowadays with YouTube, I mean, you're a lot younger than I am. But but nowadays you can get so much education. It's all free. And uh, channels like mine, uh, our friend Sabina, others doing a lot of um, a, a lot of work to popularize this for free. And you can do stuff yep. nowadays. As I say, my job is to you know you guys should always be curious. ABC. And you, I'm creating the university I wish existed that you can attend with no student loan debt in your pajamas, <laughs> taught by yeah. professors like Dr. James Beecham for free, you know, in your pajamas. Yeah. But yeah, go no, ahead. I, I, I don't want to lose track and of the, of the. I want to get to the no, moon. I, yeah, I know we got to get to the moon too, but I completely agree with you. And I, actually, just in terms of keeping it local with uh, with you, I did those two years of uh, of introductory physics courses to reintroductory physics courses at San Diego Community College. So oh, wow. there we go. Well, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so what you do as a physicist is, as an experimentalist these days with the high energy physics is you, again, a lot of data analysis, a lot of coding, but also just physical reasoning, right? So you really do need to understand the physics behind some, you know, data analysis you're going to do. This is a huge data set that's gigantic, even as an undergrad or like a, you know, as a grad student, if you're working on these experiments, it's a very large data set. So you need to use physical reasoning to hone in on some subset of the data and then do the data reduction and figure out exactly what it is you're looking for. You need to go back to the first principles from even you know, Feynman diagrams, the theory maybe uh, that inspires what you're looking for. Maybe you're looking for a Z prime particle, a new force carrying particle. Maybe you're looking for quantum black holes. Mm -hmm. This You have to understand how that might show up in your detector as a particular uh, signature. Right. And as a grad student, you do a large amount of that type of thing, you know, physical reasoning, uh, simulating events, uh, doing the data analysis and then writing papers. But as an experimentalist, you also get to fiddle around with electronics <laughs> and hardware. And because these detectors, I mean, Atlas is six stories high, 46 meters long. It's like a gigantic soda can tipped on its side and filled with extremely complicated electronics. And all these pieces come from all over the world. So they are manufactured and designed all over the world. You got a piece from Israel, you got a piece from Japan, you got a piece from, uh, you know, from Sweden, a piece from multiple places in the US. And they all have to be come together as a, you know, clockwork and come together and really fit this thing. To, and it's, it's almost, it's astounding in so many ways that it works the way it does. It's really sort of the, the definition of um, laudable global collaboration, which is very related <laughs> to my idea for this uh, circular collider on the moon. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, uh, interstellar, inter, uh, intersolar system, beyond global. Yes, well, exactly, yeah, exactly. It's a solar system uh, collaboration, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll get, we'll get to these, uh, you know, uh, as you said, we should sort of start pushing forward. And so the motivation for, so the, but again, to kind of like recenter ourselves in terms of the story, right? It's like, we right now, we have, we have looked at this 13 TeV that we have at the LHC, this energy range that allows us to get to sort of a maximal mass range of what a new particle could be. And it could, if it exists in nature, we could be able to produce it in abundance and discover it outright, right? But beyond that, we have to go to higher energies. And again, it's, it's it really, it, it's a completely meaningless question to ask how motivated is, is a bigger collider? It really isn't. It's completely meaningless because there's no there's no way for you to point towards something. The right. motivation no is we, 
We don't know, the motivation is we don't know the mass scale of, uh, of new particles and fields. We therefore have to go as high as we can. The syllogism is completely complete. You can't argue with it. <laughs> you can't argue with the, with, the, you know, with, the, with the amount of resources that it might take to build something, but you can't argue with the, the logical syllogism that gets you to that conclusion. And it comes from just the fact that you can, we've done this our entire, you know, our entire physics lifetime, last hundred years, every, more than a hundred years, every time we built something bigger, we've learned new things about the universe. Or as I say, James, this time is not different. No, it, it is not. It's, it's just a continuation of what we've done. <laughs> yeah. I agree. And so, yeah, starting back in 19, you know, in 1897, where you could really, you know, really could, uh, discover something by yourself on a tabletop right this is an amazing time i'm sure but then of course we a connection yeah, sorry i like, can't resist connection to cmb polarization the father of thompson scattering thompson's cross-section that's where cmb polarization comes from jj thompson absolutely keep going yep absolutely keep, keep it yes the, you know these these guys uh, really shout changed out. the yep. changed the world completely in many ways and then, yeah, so in terms of shout outs, we got to shout out E.O. Lawrence as well, right? Because he built the first, the world's first cyclotron, right? Which more or less accelerated particles in this circle, right? In, in, in this thing you can hold in your hand. And I think this one is actually at Berkeley somewhere, like in, yeah. a, in a museum or something. Um, and this, what this did is it provided in principle a way to control these particles trajectories into a circle so that you could use them for something such as bombarding a target or eventually to collide particles together, right? And so the kinetic energy to which you can accelerate a particle in a circular collider depends mainly upon the size of your collider and the strength of the magnets that you use to bend them, right? And so this was the first one, which was 36 centimeters in circumference. So bigger machines, big bigger energies, and therefore bigger dis po uh, possibility of discovery. So then you had the proton synchrotron, 628 meters around and 59. I'm skipping over some things, right? But like, just to kind of get us to the next, in a sense, the next big thing. People ask this question sometimes. I have no idea what this guy's, the, the buckets. I have asked the CERN archivists and they don't know either. <laughs> he's, he's probably, you know, controlling for some kind of uh, cooling leak or something. I don't know. I have no idea what he's doing. Then to put this kind of in context, we had something like, you know, this, we had something like the, um, the, uh, the proton synchrotron, 628 meters uh, in circumference, and that got to 24 GeV. And just in contrast, this is a Thompson. And so on the bottom, you'll see what it is that we discovered when we went to a bigger collider, right? Yeah. So then uh, when you go to the, then we had something called the alternating gradient synchrotron, which is one of the two experiments that discovered the, the J psi or the charm quark. This is the 1960s, 800 meters, big step forward, right? Mm -hmm. Then you had something called the super proton synchrotron, also at CERN, seven kilometers around, mind blowing, right? Mm -hmm. 540 GeV, completely unprecedented, yeah? Then you had something like the Tevatron, which is a jump forward as well in energy because of the different magnet technology they use, but it's around the same, it's a similar size range, right? Mm -hmm. And this was the 1983, and of course we discovered the top quark. Oh yeah, and then of course the SPS, the blue one, the W and the Z bosons were discovered, momentous occasion. If anybody ever comes to visit me at CERN, I come, I, I give them the behind the scenes James tour, the VIP tour, and I take them to the shaft where you can look down and I can point down and I say down there in that little place there, that's where they discovered the W and Z bosons. And everybody's uh, mind is blown when they see that. It's great. I should have put a photo over here. Then you had the Large Hadron Collider. And this is a huge step forward, right? So basically similar technology, right? You have to have superconducting magnets or you know uh, very strong magnets to get something up to higher energies, 27 kilometers around, yeah? But again, this is the highest one we have now. And we're at this desert. Like you said, this desert, we have the LHC here. The discovery could be anywhere. So how far up do we go? The next idea, of course, is this notion of the FCC, right? The Future Circular Collider. And that's a big step. We have to do this. There's no question. If we don't, we'll never know what's there, right? This is the idea to get something that's like 100 uh, kilometers around and would reach up to the sort of like hundreds of TeV range. That's a huge step forward. Beyond that, what do we do, right? Is there some, is, but that's not the all, that's not the only idea, right? So like uh, we have the we have the uh, uh, oh, and of course I, on the the bottom here when you have the LHC, that's when the Higgs boson was discovered. But that's the last piece. That's the last guaranteed discovery. Beyond that, we have huge open questions and no guarantee. So the next machine could either be something like a future circular collider at CERN or a similar you know size thing, maybe to be eighty kilometers. I don't know called the CEPC, which would then have a successor, which would be the SPPC. These refer to, at first you'd start colliding electron positron, which means you can do precision measurements of the Higgs boson and other particles. And then after that, you can use the same tunnel 
to build something that would collide protons, it would be one of these jump it jumps up in energy, right? It, and when are these going to happen, right? This is, this is 2040s. This is something we're looking for into the future, right? And so there's also been a, an idea floated, if you will, to have a collider in the sea. And so these are some of, some of my colleagues in the U.S., um, uh, such as Peter McIntyre, Texas A&M. They are, you know, uber accelerator experts, and they have the same attitude toward particle physics in the future that I do. They say, we don't know what the next scale of particles and fields is. Let's go as big as we can. We can, we can reasonably do so. That's technologically possible in the next few decades. So this is an idea where they would actually float a collider at neutral buoyancy at a rate, uh, in about 100 meters under the Gulf of Mexico. And they, in principle, think that the technology is possible to do that. This could maybe get to 500 TeV or 700 TeV. It's not possible to know when that's going to happen. However, beyond that, what do we do, right? What is it possible for us to get bigger to that? What if instead we were to think about building a circular collider around the moon? So this would be something that could get, this would be 11,000 kilometers around. And in principle, it could get to 14 PeV. And this is the idea. So. A few decades, sorry, a few years ago, this is the idea that I would float to blow people's minds. Like, what if we could do this and like kind of inspire them? It's like, you should do this and you should find this and maybe we could do this. But I never really put it down on the page. And now I put it down on the page. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is, a, this is an article that we put out just a few days ago um, on the archive with my colleague, Frank Zimmerman. I can go into some details about Frank, but he in fact was one of my sort of uh, very inspiring idols. Um, I happened to come across, and actually one of the people that sort of blew my minds about ten, that blew my mind about ten years ago. I happened to come across. Uh, I happened to be in the room with uh, for for a talk that he gave at an APS meeting in Denver. I was there presenting on something else, and he gave this talk about future colliders and things. And then at the end, he's like, "Oh, and beyond that, you know, beyond terrestrial colliders, maybe at some point we could think about getting bigger ones, such as floating a circular collider. Or I'm sorry, floating uh, floating a linear collider uh, in space between the Earth and the Moon." And I was just like, I was a grad student. I'm like, "Whoa, this is, blows my mind." So I think Frank was the natural person for me to uh, call upon about you know six months ago when I decided I said, "Hey, why don't we put this down as an actual kind of you know uh, a, a concrete idea." Right, and so in principle, this could get to something like a, a, a thousand times the energy of the LHC. But of course, there are some uh, challenges to such an idea. Right, um, this is the moon, and of course, it would not look like this. Probably, it would end up looking uh, like this instead. So this is the face that always faces. There's one, as you know, the moon and Earth are tidally locked, and so we basically see see the same side of the moon all the time. And due to uh, various features of the, of the moon, um, it turns out that probably the best trajectory for such a thing would be to loop around the moon, kind of like uh, the, 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 around the edge that we see from Earth. Um, the front part of the, the moon is very smooth compared to the back part, which is extremely rocky. And it turns out you can kind of like find a trajectory that's uh, in there that sort of hopefully avoids a lot of the, a lot of the, um, uh, the, elevation changes that you would have to uh, potentially, you know, um, address if you wanted to do such a thing. But of course, before we get too far, we should ask the question, why a circular collider on the moon, right? So obviously the science part is to me clear. I hope I've made the case that we need to go as big as we can, that's technologically possible with any reasonable amount of time. And that will give us a, such a, something like this would give us three orders of magnitude jump and collision energy, which would open up huge uh, potential for discovery. And the um, the other uh, the other quite the other reason for this would be that building something larger than what we currently have on the Earth is going to be tougher and tougher the bigger we get. And I have a tiny bit of detail on this in a moment. But the last one is to me the most important reason, and it, because it seems inevitable that humans are going to return to the Moon, so we need to keep this in mind when we when we think about what it means to go back to the Moon. And I hope to expand upon that for a couple of minutes at the very end. But just to kind of Emphasize you might the, the one of the biggest uh, you know objections might be okay the moon is eleven thousand kilometers you could definitely fit that on the earth somewhere so why don't you just do it on the earth okay that's true what if we were to build something like this that could circle all the way around I mean in principle you could fit it all the way completely in Russia maybe depends 
If you do that, you're already immediately going to go underneath huge mountain ranges, and you're going to also, and inevitably, because you'd have to have anytime you, you know, you if you'd wanted uh, to build a tunnel underneath, you're going to end up having to have a lot of different access shafts everywhere. You end up displacing local populations. You'd end up, you know, just really sort of disrupting a lot of people's lives. Is that the way to go? Maybe that's the better way. I don't really know, but it seems to me that it's going to be very, very difficult to do that. Also, it's going to be very difficult to a certain extent to get a large global collaboration to do something uh, that is that is owned by one particular country um, these days. You, in principle, could also do it down here. Okay, maybe you could, but any anywhere you pick that's sort of land based, that's a similar size, you're going to end up digging underneath gigantic things, such as the Himalayas, right? I mean, I don't know how you're going to avoid the Himalayas if you wanted to do something like this. In principle, you could also just put it in the ocean. However, you could do something much larger in the Pacific Ocean, in fact. However, I don't know how you're going to control the currents that you would get in there. So the guys for the Gulf of Mexico, because it, the currents that are in the Gulf of Mexico are much uh, milder than what you get on the large scale. Um, in the in the Pacific Ocean, I'm not sure you could achieve the same technology uh, of this. You know, find some kind of neutral buoyancy um, technology that would enable such a thing in the Pacific Ocean. Again, I'm happy to be proven wrong. You know, because part of the reason why you even write a project or write a paper like this is to kind of just you know raise the idea so that maybe somebody can knock it down and come up with a better idea, right? So these are the reasons why. Um, and why you would want to do something on the moon instead. And so to me, the, the, the idea of putting something on the moon is interesting because of that, right? It's like doing something on the earth seems like a larger and larger energy seems like it's gonna be very, very difficult. Um, and oh, in fact, let's see, I, I should, I wanna show this slide first before, before I go to the other slides. And so I, I just wanna kind of mention that this is not necessarily the craziest idea that you have heard because ideas like this have been around for a very long time. So if you flash back to 1954, just before he died, um, Enrico Fermi predicted that a Globotron encircling the earth would be built by 1994, right? And in his mind, this would reach a collision energy of, of five PEV. And in 1954 dollars, it would cost $170 million. Uh, so this is an idea really that has just been around for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And it's just the sort of continuation of There's that. There's one other yeah? thing. <clears throat> and just, um, we, we should wrap up probably at about 10 to 12 okay. minutes, James, just because I have uh, another sure. call coming in. But um, the US Antarctic program is in part stationed at the South Pole with the CMB telescopes, ice cube, et cetera, because it's uh, the only way that we maintain legal and uh, military whatever presence at the South Pole, which you can barely see in the image here. Uh, from Earthrise, right. so you know, strategically, it may be a uh, part of the U.S. you know Space Force command, ironically pitting you in in parallel with your uh, favorite president, the previous president. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, but yes, yeah, so that that's another quiver in your arrow for the lunar collider. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so let's keep going. For sure. Yeah, I'll just wrap up in a few minutes here. So I mean, we could go on for a very long time. Yeah, that's uh, but, fun. You know. Um, but, you know, th this is the, the idea behind it. And just to give a few of the kind of technical details, I, I encourage people to kind of read the paper and, and obviously criticize. We've already had some really good comments that people have, you know, that have come up with, um, because I like to see all the, you know, flaws in my thinking, uh, as any good scientist uh, should, right? And so you, uh, dependent, based upon, so in the, in the paper, we paint like three possible scenarios as to how to uh, dig something like, or build something like this. One, you put it on the surface. This is more or less a no-go because the temperature variations from lunar day to night are huge. And you, if you wanted to build something very large on the surface, you'd need to have the magnets be superconducting. And you can use something called high temperature superconductors, but that's also uh, high in that case is very, very low compared to what we have in, uh, on, you know, uh, on uh, like earth, um, uh, you know, um, room temperature, right? In principle, the, when the moon is in shade, the temperatures do get low enough so you could use high temperature superconductors. But that only happens for a very small amount of time if you have an entire ring on the outside, right? It's like it's going to go around and only for, for like a, maybe an hour or something, the entire thing was going to be in shade. That's a deal breaker. You could, in principle, do with what we call a cut and cover, right? You could dig a trench just a few meters underneath, and then put some put some uh, some regolith on top. This is the soil and the and the on the moon, right? If you do that, you're still not going to completely win everything be, because you're still the the day night temperature variations are still maybe going to be a problem. But if you even get a few uh, a few dozens of centimeters underneath the the lunar surface, the temperature is fixed but and not cold enough to be in, to ensure uh, high temperature high temperature superconductors. So you're going to have to use a cooling system anyway, no matter what you do. It seems 
So, and also if it's just underneath the surface, you are open to possible meteoroid strikes that can actually do some damage, right? You don't want that to happen. So probably the best way is to really dig a tunnel. And so that's why this is uh, schematically here. You might dig something maybe 200 meters under the surface or something like that. And so really just uh, we, we happen to kind of look and see at, uh, uh, you know, uh, at the, the you know, temperature, I'm sorry, the elevation variations that you see on the moon here. And if you look very closely, you can find a trajectory that seems to miss some of the largest uh, the elevation uh, changes. Although, of course, not all of them. And this is we left for future work a lot of uh, a lot of things in this paper, one of which is to do a very detailed uh, use like a detailed geological survey of the moon to uh, find a very like the kind of perfect trajectory. Because if you look closely at even this image, you'll see that there's a big problem in one of these places, for example, right there. So this in principle would demonstrate that you're gonna to have to have, if you're, if you're gonna dig this thing a few, a couple of hundred meters under the surface of the moon, but at some point it's gonna go over one of these large mare. And this is the, this is the mare uh, Humboldt, Humboldtianum, I believe. Yeah, and this is, this is like something like five kilometers deep. So this is a problem, right? Mm -hmm. However, one of the, again, I'm just giving you a flavor of the sort of things you have to think about as an experimentalist, you know, as, as you know, but just to give people a flavor. So if you're digging and you've got five kilometers underneath you, you think, okay, this is crazy. How are we going to build like an actual structure, like a tube that has to go over five kilometers and somehow like hold it up? First of all, I think that any civilization that uh, is sufficiently advanced to dig a tunnel around the entire uh, surface of the moon, you know, 100 meters under the surface, 200 meters under the surface of the moon would be able to solve such a problem. The other part is that you probably on the moon don't even need a beam enclosure. You could actually have a bare beam in some places because the, the vacuum on the, the moon is much, much better than even the vacuum that we have down in the, that we actually have to super pump down in the LHC itself. So in principle, you could just have this beam shooting over the entire Mare itself. That's right. <laughs> So we're, I'm just sort of wrapping up here. I just wanted to kind of get to some of the, the you know, the, the kind of fun details. People have been thinking about going back to the moon a lot for a very long time, obviously. So an idea like this really just sort of piggybacks on so many fantastic ideas that have come before it. So for example, people are thinking about using these lunar lava tubes, which are left over kind of pock, pock marks underneath the surface that could, in principle could be gigantic and you could host entire cities. You don't want things to be on the surface because of, you'll get a lot of cosmic radiation that could in principle just kill uh, humans that, if they're based upon the surface for a very long amount of time, right? One of the biggest problems that we face is powering. Right? And I just want to give a flavor of the powering here, right? And so you probably, but based upon our calculations, you would need some kind of <clears throat> 10 terawatt source uh, to uh, power the CCM. Uh, this is a challenge because uh, you can estimate that approximately the entire uh, power consumption of humanity um, is at the kind of 20 terawatts level. <laughs> so then you need something that would be about half of what, uh, uh, taking up half of the energy we currently use at all. This is not necessarily such a problem because you can imagine using some kind of uh, solar power, right? Because the sun is giving out all this free power all the time. Here down on Earth, we have atmosphere to deal with. We have, you know, in inefficient, uh, we have inefficient, uh, you know, solar panels, et cetera, et cetera. On the moon, that's not such a problem. So based upon the calculations, you would need a little patch about the size of Delaware to that's entirely really good solar panels and you could power the entire thing. Mm. However, that is that patch is not going to be in the sun, in the sun all the time because the moon of course has this you know this day night which is about you know it has like 13.8 earth days is one of their days so instead why don't you build an entire belt a dyson belt around the entire equator of the of the moon at that guarantees that at some point at some point on the moon is always uh, in as is always in the sun when I wrote this down for the paper, I was like, oh, that's really, that's good. I'm sure somebody else has thought about that. And of lo and behold, of course, somebody has thought about this. There's an entire corporation uh, in Japan, the Shimizu Corporation. They, they actually took this seriously. This idea, did, idea had been around for a long time, but they took this seriously after the Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi um, power plant failure. They think, how, is, how could we actually solve Earth's uh, power needs? And one of these is the, this lunar ring idea. Anyway, et cetera, et cetera. We can go on for a very long time, but... The, the biggest things that come to mind is like, where are you going to manufacture all this stuff? Are you going to just take these things from Earth and, and, and transport them to the moon? No, you want to manufacture things on the moon. Luckily, people have been thinking about that for a long time. So, of course, we get to the kind of money ideas. What's the budget for such a thing? It's nearly impossible to estimate, <laughs> given what we know, right? And what's the timeline? 2100s? We don't really know, right? 
the key thing here is not necessarily to give a particular timeline, right? It's not, we're not necessarily supposed, we're not trying to, again, it's not a proposal, right? This is right. just an idea concept. for something that we could do, right? It's a, it's sort of a proof of concept in a way. Um, and, you know, cause the, the most important part of my kind of reasons you want to do this to me is that bottom one. And just to finish up here, the bottom one was that it seems as though humans are going to go back to the moon inevitably. I mean, this seems that's the direction everything's going, right? So, you know, back in the 60s, of course, and then, you know, uh, you've got the International Space Station, but then, of course, you now have current things like SpaceX and NASA are collaborating and really getting better at, uh, at, at getting, you know, eventually getting back to the moon. And of course, NASA has been thinking about moon bases for a very long time. And you've got people like, you know, the people at this Moon Express, right? They're like, return to the moon, this time to stay. And then you've got like the Google Lunar X Prize, right? Sort of like trying to bribe people to, you know, corporations to go back to the moon, right? And my idea is that we should instead, instead of just thinking about what it is that we can, you know, we can like allow private corporations to do on the moon, we should instead center projects that actually benefit all of humanity. That to me is the most important thing. Because I'll be honest with you, I'm going to get a little bit sentimental here. I personally left my own devices. I would prefer that we um, protect the moon against com commercial exploitation in perpetuity. I would prefer that. That's probably impossible. Instead, I think what we should do with a proposal, you know, this is kind of my idea with, a, with an idea like a CCM. Let's center projects that are for the public good. Because the CCM is, you know, things like the LHC, they pay for themselves many times over with the people that you train, the technology that are invented that can be transferred to private industry, et cetera, et cetera. These things pay for themselves over and over and over. But the reason we do them is simply because we're curious about the universe and about our place in the universe. Yeah. So that's why, you know, you'd have something like this and it would not just be a CCM. It would be an L park, right? This would be the Lunar Particle and Astrophysics Research Center. Astronomy, very long baseline neutrino experiment between Earth and Moon, et cetera, et cetera. You can do all these things. This to me is the most important part because we, as it stands now, we're basically just giving up space and the moon and Mars to billionaires. And that to me is extremely immoral and super depressing, to be honest. It's like, I don't, you know, when so many of us have been losing our jobs through the pandemic and like getting sick, billionaires increase their, you know, their, their wealth by like what, 1.2 trillion or something like that. And if you've seen this most recent ProPublica, I think it's kind of nice that, you know, CCM uh, idea comes out the day before the ProPublica article comes out that shows that all these billionaires basically paying no taxes at all, right? We should not be giving contracts, in my mind, we should not be giving them, just sort of giving them to these guys. Instead, we should be taxing them and, and compelling them to pay us to get to go to the moon. Anyway, so that's the whole idea for me is that I would like to, I would like people to keep in mind that when we set, you know, the moon should belong to all of us. And if we were to keep in mind ideas like, you know, it doesn't have to be a CCM. I mean, again, this notion of like the, the lunar ring around the ring, that very much changes the appearance of the moon from Earth. And maybe that's a deal breaker. We don't want to do that maybe because it'll change the way that people, you know, it ruins poetry for a very long time, right? <laughs> and so, you know, again, but if we center something like a CCM or like, you know, a, a science center that has, you know, uh, like telescopes on the far side of the moon, right, so that they're radio quiet, etc. These are fantastic ideas. These instead will remind us that moon, the moon and space and Mars, these things that allow us, you know, to, to think big, they really should belong to all of us. It should not just be in the hands of a few. Right. A different kind of inspiration. <clears throat> well, James, I want yes. to thank you so much for going into the impossible. Some say, it was impossible to get to the South Pole. Some say it would be impossible to build a collider under two different countries that were historically, you know, battling uh, for for resources for hundreds of years prior to yes. the construction of CERN, et cetera, which has been great for peace, great for training, great for advancing knowledge. I'll put links to uh, to to different videos that we've had previous appearances by James. I will put them on the screen in various locations. Uh, I want to point out I've had Jessica Meir who was on the space station that you showed, and she is a member of Project Artemis. I'm hoping she'll be the first woman to walk on the moon. I'll put a link to that somewhere. And uh, may, may, we, may we go back for all man and womankind uh, in peace and, uh, and for, for the benefit of our species. That is absolutely uh, what, what science is good for. And James, I wanna thank you for your creativity for your insight and for inspiring people. Hopefully there's a young person out there who uh, will be just as inspired as I am <clears throat> by the inventiveness, the inquisitiveness, but also there's really grounded hardcore science that's going on here. Uh, James has the, the best of both worlds. You're doing something that is um, low risk, high reward, 
and high risk and high reward. And I think that's that's a really smart strategy. You want to diversify your portfolio, just like you do in economics. Uh, you want to do that with your research portfolio as well. James, thank you so much for going into the impossible. Thanks, Brian. Okay, let me end. Uh, I'm going to end the video here.